as we come to celebrate God's word together. Let us first come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, help us. Oh Lord, help us in hearing your word. Not the agendas that distract us. Not the preset ideals we want to fulfill. But your truth first, O oh Lord. And your revelation. That we might abide in you. And in abiding in you, we might offer your truth unto others. We might be a sign, a beacon, even as Christ is our light. We come in his name. O oh Lord, guide our understanding. This in Christ we pray. Amen. We have just spent about a month and a bit telling and retelling and celebrating and announcing the birth of Christ, the Son of the living God, holy begotten, born of a virgin, born of the line of David, preeminent over all creation, and to him, and at the sound of his name, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So why not tell everyone about it? Why does Jesus, at any time, in any of his ministry, say to anyone, and going town to town, why does he tell these demons? Now, don't say anything. Of all the things to silence, to tell the demons to be quiet about Jesus. They know him. They know who he is. So why not tell the people? Why not tell what they know? Let the word get out. Let the shouting start. Let the earth make some noise. Because it matters who shouts the name of Jesus. Not everyone who wants to go out preaching is suited to go out preaching. To go out declaring the gospel as a preacher. There are many kinds of ministries, many kinds of gifts. And you do not necessarily want a person who thinks that they deserve, who thinks that they know that they've earned the right to go out with authority and be the one preaching the truth to you. Because too often those ones often end up preaching a truth that's their truth. And not always God's. And a lot of people are blind to that. Blind because of convincing arguments. Blind because of charismatic speech. Blind because of good, reasonable, researched ideas. And second, is that it takes more than the natural gifts of preaching and charismatic speaking, and even Bible knowledge. To speak about Jesus the way that people need to hear about Jesus. Paul does not share the gospel because he deserves to be there sharing the gospel. It's not that he's earned the right. But because after setting himself to be anything but a preacher of the gospel of Christ. Even in himself being anti-Christ. God still called on him to do this ministry of the gospel when we meet him, when God meets him on the road to Damascus. I think it's incredibly ironic that two of the chief people the gospels declare to be the leaders of sharing the gospel in the early church, in the first generation of the church, are two people that can clearly be Identified one by Christ specifically in the role of Satan or the role of the deceiver. There is Paul going about stoning Christians or condoning the stoning and the beating up of Christians there at the killing of Stephen. Paul, who was on his journey as Saul to Damascus to go after the Christians. That's when he's called. 
and the other? Well, you know the story of Peter and Jesus. Peter, who had just said, you are the son of the living God, told Jesus that by no means was he going to the cross. There's no means is he going to be brought up in prosecution. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. It's not when we think we deserve to be preaching the gospel that we ought to be preaching the gospel, but when we are called. So Saul becomes Paul. All the righteousness of Saul gets left behind. He becomes Paul and he goes to Jews and he goes to Gentiles and he speaks to servants and then he speaks to masters. He speaks to freemen and he speaks to the slaves, to those in the law and outside the law and beyond the law, at least in their own mind. Paul discovers in his ministry for Christ that he is exactly who God needs him to be, exactly who these people need in each of these situations where he finds himself. And God wouldn't have put him there if he wasn't. How in reading today from 1 Corinthians is Paul testifying, saying that I, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means Save some. The key to this evangel evangelistic mindset is for believers to acknowledge that not everyone has the vantage view of realized salvation. We can often come across as requiring people to come and to be like us before we let them know about Christ. To worship God or to encounter Christian faith fully, rightly among us. Oh, we might be encouraged to set aside certain habits, sure, to conform to a time, to a place, to a moment together. But there is no starting place where we cannot go to help others realize God's love for them. I want you to ask what you are willing to do to reach out to people. Not what you've already done or what you are doing, but for you to think of ways in your own life's context and reaching out where God is placing and calling you to share what you believe. That is why in the next few weeks, things said here are going to be so important. From February 21st to March 21st, we are going to sermon by sermon and scripture by scripture grow in our understanding of our own declaration of our faith, to engage in one of the most fundamental declarations of faith that's ever existed in the church beyond what's already stated and really from what's stated in the Bible itself. We need to know what we believe before we can share it and really before we can truly live it. So we'll be looking at the Apostles' Creed and what creeds are, the life of creeding and stating our belief in the church, in the life of the church. What then? Now that we'll have this formed faith, do we get out and conform the world to that faith? That's not what we're shown or told in Scripture. Jesus does not come into Capernaum or into Nazareth to conjole and to argue. Now, the arguments are there. They're waiting for him all along the way. But even Jesus, he convinces by grace. By listening, by sitting, he eats with the sinners. He encounters the weakness, the hurt, the blind, the broken, the criminal. And offers faith as healing and not as judgment. And Jesus commanded the demons not to speak because they knew him. And knowing Jesus is not the same as believing in Jesus. If I have to argue with someone to get them to come to church, then all I've done is offered a, a reasonable argument for what should be beyond reason and requiring faith in order for the relationship I'm trying to build here to work. 
I don't argue with my wife to convince her. I didn't do it to convince her to marry me or to stay with me. And the only explanation I could give her is the one that I still give her. That I love her. I tell her this not to remind or to reassure, but to celebrate that love. That is what we need to have. That is what we need to share about our love for God and our love from God. And the gospel begins to be shared when we say, God loves you. God loves you so much that he made this world, this universe for you. For you to show him that you can love him back. God loves you so much that God gives you guidance and examples to follow. And reminders through the generations and through scripture. Examples of God's love in people's lives. God loves you so much that there was air to breathe and food to eat today and a, a warm, safe place for you to, to come to and worship and go home to and rest. Even if that's out there in the world, wherever you are right now. And God loves you so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, that is the beginning of the gospel. That is how we start. And we are going to be singing about these things. Singing just as soon as we can kick COVID to the curb. And we're going to have fellowship celebrating our journey through the good times and the bad times in that love that comes from God. And we read the Bible to learn more and to hear each other's points of view about that love. And we pray every day. Just, even just to remind ourselves that God who loves us is always listening. Is always telling us that we are loved. And that we need to love one another. But the message is getting muffled out there. I mean, after we've had this time, after we close the book, after we get up from the prayer, after the, the, the tide of sickness and the disease and the war and the famine and the disasters and the mess of this earth and the mess of our lives and we're grieving where we're crying, how long, O oh Lord? And the message gets muffled in the wake of our sin. You know, it's going to seem like a moment. These troubles we're facing. These trials we go through. This is the way we will look back over all of this from eternity. And that is where we need to put our minds. And get them away from these fears. And these doubts that are tearing us apart. We don't know the day or the hour, but we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ, that he is Lord, the son of the living God. And this is not told to us by a good argument or by a reasonably laid out narrative in the scriptures. But it is something that must be spoken to us in the Holy Spirit. And that we enjoy, declare, God loves me. I love you, Lord. A good debate about what we believe is wonderful in the faith. Between faiths. In the world. It can be enlightening and engaging but what is better is the way that that faith is kindled by love and, and truth entering into people's lives. 
In the witness of the presence of God as God loves, God's love dwells in you as the Holy Spirit moves in you. But faith is not a point to argue. And while you can offer many explanations, let the truth begin whatever you offer to answer people's inquiry as to why or how you live the fullness of life that you live. Even after you've been through so much and what you've seen in the world around you, let them know that God loves you so much.